Lady Jailbait Dondarian has died. Let us move forward with our plan to switch the heirs. What? You're planning on switching Lady Jailbait's heir? I didn't know that. You didn't know that. Really, Chad? I personally asked you several times to try to convince Lady Jailbait to switch her heir. We organized that huge hunt with the White Stag to try to convince her. That was really expensive. Lord Oakhart was fired and sent back to Old Oak specifically because he was pushing the issue too hard. I mean, I remember you and Lord Oakhart crying in the rain over the issue. And then we had to go through all that trouble to murder Lord Manwoody to get Lord Oakhart back. And we've all been pushing the rumors that Lady Jailbait's children are bastards and that she has committed adultery. I mean, we've been doing this for years. You really didn't figure out that we were all conspiring to do this. No, nah, man. I just figured you guys were dicks. And our episode begins with a little boy brazenly walking out of the king's bedroom after discovering that Viserys is dead. The king's bedroom. Oh gosh. Honestly, what are the king's guard for? They can't protect the king. They can't protect the queen. They can't protect the heir. They can't protect the maybe other heir. They can't protect any of the children. They accidentally kill nobles and ruin weddings. Besides occasionally providing orgasms, honestly, what use do these guys have? Well, hold on, Brandon. We're not sure if that little boy was coming from the king's room. He could have taken a secret passage to another room and then left that room. But it doesn't matter. We find out this episode that the king's guard know about the secret passages. They didn't guard the route to the king. They are completely and utterly incompetent. Anyway, this kid tells Miguel Sapachnik's wife that the king is dead, and I am just baffled by the timeline. I'm sorry, Brandon. This seemed pretty straightforward. What's so confusing? Well, the king dies the same evening as the dinner last episode, right? And we know this because the queen is wearing the same dress she was at the dinner right before Viserys dies. Yeah, okay, what's the big deal? Um, where is Rhaenyra? Well, she said she was going to leave for Dragonstone. Really? She meant immediately. Like, right after the dinner, she and her family all went back to their rooms, packed their things, then in darkness were escorted all the way to the port, woke up the harbor master and sailors, and set sail when it was cloudy no less and no stars to guide them towards Dragonstone, rather than just, you know, waiting until the next morning like normal human beings? Um, yes? Even though it was established that she and Alicent were warming to one another, she left suddenly in the middle of the night without saying goodbye to her father. I guess so. Rhaenyra likes ghosting. Okay, fine. Where's Bela? Bela? Yeah, you know, Rhaenys' ward. Where did she go? Um, back with Rhaenyra and Daemon, maybe? Oh, is that how warding works? You just leave and break your warding. Um, maybe the betrothal changed things? Uh-huh. So she left Moondancer behind at King's Landing. Um, Moondancer? Yeah, her dragon. Rhaenys clearly flew to King's Landing, which means one would think Bela did the same. So, where is Moondancer? Or did Bela choose to fly to Dragonstone in the middle of the night ahead of Rhaenyra and Daemon? Um, well, I guess she didn't bring her dragon after all, and she sailed with Vaymond? Well, fine. This all seems very, very lucky. It just seems very lucky that everyone illogically left in the middle of the night and evaded a coming danger. It's almost like they all read the script and knew Viserys was gonna die. But fine, let's all accept this great huge coincidence. Doesn't this also mean that Otto should be sending a fleet out to capture Rhaenyra? Um... I mean, think about it. Rhaenyra, Daemon, Jace, Luke, Bela, and Reyna are all on a ship together, helpless, without their five dragons that they ride. Shouldn't the Green Faction be trying to do everything they can to capture them now, before they get home to Dragonstone? You know, nip that war right in the bud? I mean, they just left, right? They are, at most, a few hours away by ship, and it was established in Episode 2 that it takes a full day to get to Dragonstone. Why on earth are they not trying to catch them? Well, you know, Otto is very, very busy pretending to give a fuck about Alicent supposedly hearing Viserys' last words. Ah yes, the accidentally heard last words regarding a prophecy that she already knew about in Episode 3. In the end, the pure contrivance of someone hearing such an important thing on one's deathbed is so ridiculous that even our boy Beesberry calls her out. Yeah, this one hits a little close to home. An old man raving about how events don't make any sense and no one giving a fuck. I suppose I'm likely to go out the same way.
By the way, were the balls only function to smash in Beast Bear's head? Because I thought maybe they were some sort of personal key, but they're left on the table when the council is not in session, so they don't really serve any function at all. They are extremely faceless men vulnerable, that's for sure. Faceless men? They can't even keep out little girls. Anyway, the crew is ordered not to remove Beesberry and keep the door shut until their business is done, a command that takes a whopping of 2 minutes and 45 seconds to be violated. And Sir Crispin Stamos gets no great speech here, or with Aegon later, demoting him from the Kingmaker to the Crown Placer. Yeah, more time was given to Barristan Westerling. Speaking of Westerling, Otto gives an order to go to Dragonstone and kill Rhaenyra, which Westerling rejects by quitting. And... that's the end of that? I mean, forgetting for a moment that Rhaenyra is not actually on Dragonstone, but instead just a few hours outside of King's Landing on a ship, Otto didn't try giving that order to anyone else? No one? He just said, Welp, Westerling quit. I guess the order is impossible. Doop de doop de doop. It's not like there aren't six other Kingsguard and all of the High Tower men in the keep. Anyway, we then get to fan favorite Helena, who says that it's our fate to crave what is given to another. If one possesses a thing, another will take it away. Which is really just a fancy way to say that jealousy is a thing? I do wonder how often she annoys this servant with her philosophy. I believe it is our fate to crave food and water. When there is sustenance, one will try to eat it. Yes, princess. I believe it is our fate to crave the state of slumber. Over time, all will become drowsy and fall asleep. Yes, princess. I believe our fate is to crave releasing stool from our bodies. At some point, our bowels will become full and push out a load of shit. Yes, princess. So Otto and Allison both go looking for Aegon and cannot find him. And suddenly, the game is afoot. It's Allison versus Otto in a race against the clock. As Allison puts it, the very fate of the Seven Kingdoms hangs in the balance. But specifically, what are the stakes? What are the stakes? Does anyone really know the stakes? Ah, uh, yes. Alicent specifically tells us what she demands at the end of the episode. Good terms for Rhaenyra, Kristen Cole to be Lord Commander, Aegon anointed at dawn, Aegon receiving full power, Aegon wearing the crown of Aegon the Conqueror, and carrying Blackfire. Now, for number four, Aegon is 20. He was going to receive full power anyway, so that one is kind of stupid. And two, three, and five, honestly, who cares? What's important is Rhaenyra. Allison clearly wants good terms sent to her because she doesn't want her to die. So you're saying the race for Aegon doesn't make any sense because if the real issue is Rhaenyra's life, why is Otto even racing to be first to find Aegon? Just send people to Dragonstone or out to sea to kill Rhaenyra. He doesn't need Aegon to do that. I mean, Otto already tried ordering the killing of Rhaenyra once. Just order another person. It's as easy as that. It's not like Alicent is going to somehow be happy with Otto if he gets to Aegon first and then kills Rhaenyra. She'll be furious, so he might as well just go ahead and make the order. The race aspect of everything is meaningless. It may be meaningless, but it sure is fun as Otto tasks the Cargyle twins and Alicent tasks Crispin and Aemond. I totally think they're fucking, by the way. Alicent and Crispin or Crispin and Aemond? Yes. And we go on a journey through the city to discover the type of man that Aegon is. Wear a cloak. Don't we already know that Aegon is a rapist who likes to masturbate out windows? Yes, but now we also know that he likes to watch children in pit fighting, has fathered a bunch of bastards, and has taken his little brother to a brothel. I mean, none of that is great, but being a rapist is way worse. I mean, did they find out anything really bad about him? Did Aegon murder anybody? Um, no. So, he's actually not as evil as Rhaenyra, Daemon, Laenor, Alicent, Crispin, Laris, or Rhaenys. Because as of the end of this episode, all of those people have murdered someone. Well, the searches don't turn up anything, but we do find out that Aemond not only believes that he would make a better king, but thinks that he's next in line, which makes me wonder if he knows something that we don't about the paternity of Helena's children. I believe that when one brother will not have sex with me, another will do his duty. Yes, princess. So in the end, the White Worm's messenger comes to the Cargyle twins, telling them that the White Worm has Aegon, but she wants to speak with the Hand in person. And I have to admit, Masaria's network has some dedication. The series has looked like he's about to die for years, and Miguel Sapachnik's wife signals that the king is dead by lighting some candles in a window, Sansa-style. 
So I'm guessing that means Masaria has had people watching that window every night for at least a decade, waiting for the right moment to kidnap Aegon in order to force the crown to shut down child fighting pits. That's quite a long game. I guess a petition was out of the question. And we're back for everyone's favorite game show, Make, Make Sense, Sense of This Line. Okay, this time we have Rainy saying, Yet you toil still in service to men, your father, your husband, your son. You desire not to be free, but to make a window in the wall of your prison. Have you ever imagined yourself on the Iron Throne? Make, make sense, sense of this line. Oh man, this is a weird one as Alicent just went on a speech about how women can rule by proxy guiding men. Not to mention Alicent herself has just spent the past few years actually sitting on the Iron Throne with people like Vaemon saying that they're the ones ruling. So of course she's imagined herself on the Iron Throne. Um, is the Iron Throne like a metaphor for human agency? Like when Rainy says the Iron Throne, she really means the Iron Throne within us all? That's uh, trailer bait. It was never meant to make sense. I'm sorry, the correct answer is Rhaenys is looking to seduce and marry Alicent so they can both rule together. We have some nice parting gifts. And so next, Otto Hightower meets with Masaria. Wear a cloak. And Otto says, You yourself are the mysterious white worm, I take it. Or are you a further peel in this stinking onion? Uh, that makes it sound like this is the first time they've met, but... Shouldn't Otto know exactly who Masaria is? What do you mean? Well, Otto clearly had a spy at Masaria's brothel in episode 1 who told him about the Air for a Day incident. Then, when her name was spoken at the small council in episode 2, he knew she was Damon's whore, and then he went to Dragonstone and saw her face to face and referred to her as a common whore. So, at minimum, we know that Otto did in fact do research on Masaria and can recognize her. Okay, I admit he should have said, Masaria, our paths cross again, you are the white worm the whole time. But perhaps he never put two and two together. Perhaps he never knew that Masaria was the white worm. Well, it's just that in episode four, Masaria tells us that she stopped being a sex worker and started being a spy master. So she couldn't in fact be the heir for a day leaker. But also in that episode, Otto receives information from the White Worm that Damon and Rhaenyra were coupling at a brothel, and he trusts this information so much that he presents it to the king without questioning it, saying that his source has never led him astray. So I'm supposed to believe that Otto somehow trusted a faceless entity known as the White Worm enough to risk his reputation, and never knew it was Masaria? I guess over the course of a couple years he got good info? On what? Damon was gone and Rhaenyra was living a fairly boring life. What on earth could the White Worm possibly provide him with? But still, even if she did provide great info on something or another and gained Otto's trust over a couple of years, Otto's own spies never figured out who the White Worm is. I mean, it's not like Masari was trying very hard to hide who she was. She stands on the balcony of her immaculate home wearing a white dress and Talia walks right up to her. As does that little boy back in episode 4. Even Aegon seems to know who she is. Why wouldn't Otto? Who else besides the Kingsguard wear white all of the time? Anyway, Missaria simply wants to end child pit fighting, which is pretty easy for Otto to comply with, and the Cargyle twins find Aegon stashed at the Grand Sept. Man, it's amazing how remarkably unreligious King's Landing is. The Sept is completely empty. Yeah, everyone's watching the big child pit fight. So Artemis fights Athos on the steps of the Sept, and Alicent's side is victorious. Aegon, the reluctant king, is brought to his mother. And now... Alicent is holding all of the cards? I'm really not quite getting how she has any leverage over Otto. Otto can order the killing of Rhaenyra at any time. How exactly does holding Aegon change that? It's not like she's going to hurt Aegon. She's not going to suddenly support Rhaenyra's claim. She has nothing. The two are fighting over a hostage that neither would ever harm or disenfranchise. The stakes were supposedly Rhaenyra, but there's nothing to prevent Otto from doing whatever he wants. Again, he already ordered the murder of Rhaenyra. He just weirdly decided not to do it a second time after Westerling turned him down. And then immediately after Alison tells her father that murder is bad, Laris asks Alicent if she wants him to murder Missaria, and Alicent says yes. Well, she doesn't verbally say yes, but she shows her feet and allows Laris to masturbate, which is yes in Westerosi sign language. The following morning, Eric Cargyle decides to defect away from Team Rapist to Team Murderer and snags Rhaenys. Wear a cloak. 
And they come across the body of Lord Coswell. Ugh, damn, I spent so much time making puns about him getting beheaded, and then they went and hanged him in the show. Now I just look like an idiot. You know, I bet Lady Coswell really likes Lord Coswell because he's well hung. We see Laris, or one of his henchmen, burning down Masaria's place. Wear a cloak. And Rhaenys insists on going to the dragon pit to get her dragon. Eric refuses, saying that there will be guards, but lucky for Rhaenys, the entire city is getting rounded up to witness the coronation at the dragon pit anyway. They all seem pretty upset, as they are missing some good child pit fighting. And then on the way to the dragon pit, Aegon also laughs at the end of episode 8. What a ridiculous plot contrivance that Viserys would switch his heir on his deathbed. But he's totally convinced when Alicent shows him a dagger. Oh, is that the dagger that you tried to cut Lucerius Velaryon's eye out with? Well, I guess my daddy did love me. And then we make it to the dragon pit, which has a bell for some reason. And based on the size of the crowd and how far away everything is, there is no way anyone can hear what's going on. Otto announces that Viserys switched his heir and... By the way, this extra here is ridiculous. He's so incredibly happy about the announcement and he's looking to his companions that don't exist and nodding to them about how great it is. It's at 5109 of the HBO version of the episode. What a guy. Aegon then enters for the coronation and is blessed by our boy Septon Eustace in the name of the warrior Smith, father and crone, because honestly, fuck the mother and maiden. Sir Crispin, the crown placer, places the crown on Aegon's head and says, let the seven bear witness to Aegon, the true king. Except for the mother and the maiden, cause fuck them. The crowd cheers, and Aegon has a little Sally Field moment. I can't deny the fact that you like me right now. You like me. But then it's all ruined by the mass murder of dozens, if not hundreds of people. In one fell swoop, Rhaenys jumps to being the most evil character in the story. By far. Sorry, Laurie Strong, you've been left in the dust. I guess the Council of 101 made the right decision after all. Rhaenys Targaryen is psychotic. What is really weird about this scene is that Rhaenys is ready to kill the Greens, but then, as we're told in the inside of the episode, she stops because of the motherly love that she sees Allison showing Aegon. Yeah, because they're both mothers. Yup, they pulled that card again. I mean, this would be a pretty shitty scene on its own, but the fact that Rhaenys just murdered dozens, if not hundreds of people, some of whom are definitely mothers, kind of detracts from the whole nurturing nature of mothers thing. The air has been switched. Are you willing to help me, Chadwick? Maybe. Ugh. Fine. Oh yeah. 